from San Mateo. It's The Cube, covering Scalar Innovation Day. Brought to you by Scalar. Hello, I'm John Furrier with The Cube. We are here in San Mateo, California, Special Innovation Day at Scalar's headquarters. We're here with Steve Newman, the founder of Scalar, and Jeff Mathis, a software engineer. Guys, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, great to have you here. So you guys introduced Power Queries. What is all this about? Yeah, so uh, the vision for Scalar is to become the platform users trust when they want to observe their systems. And Power Queries is a really important step along that journey. Uh, Power Queries provide new insights into data with a powerful and expressive query language that's still easy to use. So why is this important? So you know, we like to th at Scalar, we like to think that we're all about speed. Um, and, and a lot of what we're known for is the kind of the raw performance of the query engine that we've built that's sitting underneath this product, um, which is one measure of speed. But really we like to think of speed as the time from a, a question in someone's head to an answer on their screen. Um, and so the whole kind of user journey is part of that. And um, you know, kind of traditionally in our product, we've, we've provided a set of basic capabilities for searching and counting and graphing. Um, that are kind of very easy uh, for people to access and so you can get in quickly, pose your question, get an answer without even having to learn uh, a query language. Um, and, and that's been great, but there are, sometimes the need goes a little bit beyond that. Um, the question that someone wants to ask is a little bit more complicated or the data needs a little bit of massaging. Um, and it just goes beyond the boundaries of what you can do in kind of those basic, um, you know, just sort of basic set of predefined abilities. Um, and so that's where uh, we wanted to um, take a step forward and you know, kind of create this more advanced language for, uh, for those more advanced cases. You know, I love the name Power Queries. Anything with power in it's got to be fast and good. So uh, um, that aside, you know, Query's been around. People know search engines, search technology, discovery, finding stuff. But as AI comes around and more scales into the system, there seems to be a lot more focus on like inference, um, intu uh, intuiting what's happening. This has been a big trend. What do you, what's your opinion on that? Because this has become a big opportunity using data. We've seen you know, log file companies go public, we know who they are and they're out there, but there's more data coming. I mean, it's not like it's stopping anytime soon. So what's the, what's the innovation that, that, that that's going to take power queries to the next level? Yeah, so one of the features that I'm really excited about in the future of power queries is our autocomplete feature. Uh, we've taken a lot of inspiration from um, just what your nav bar does in uh, the, the browser. Um, so the idea is to uh, have a context sensitive, uh, predictive, autocomplete feature that's going to take into account uh, a number of uh, individual, uh, the syntactic uh, context of where you are in the query, um, what fields you have available to you, what fields you've searched recently, those kinds of uh, factors. Steve, what's your take? Before we get to the customer impact, what's the, what's the diff what makes it different? What's, where, where is Power Query's gonna shine today and tomorrow? So it's, um, this is actually, it was a kind of both an interesting and fun challenge uh, for us to, to design and build this um, because you're, you know, we're trying to you know, by definition, this is for the you know the more advanced use cases, the more you know when you need something more powerful. And um, so, a big part of the ch uh, design question for us is how do we how do we let people you know do more sophisticated things with their logs when the when they have that that use case, while still making it some you know kind of preserving that that speed and ease of use um, that that we like to think we're known for and. Um, and in particular, you know, that meant, you know, something where, you know, step one is go, you know, read this 300 page reference manual and, you know, learn this complicated query language. Um, you know, if, if, if that was the approach, then, you know, then we would have failed before we started. And uh, but we, had, we have the benefit of a lot of hindsight. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of history of people manipulating data, you know, working with the sophisticated different and, and different kinds of, of systems. So there are, uh, you know, we have users coming to us who are used to working with other um, uh, other log management tools. We have users who are more comfortable with SQL. Uh, we have users uh, who really, you know, their focus is just on more conventional uh, programming languages, uh, especially because, you know, one of, one of the constituencies we serve are, you know, it's a trend nowadays that development engineers are responsible f also for keeping their code working well in production. Um, so they're not experts in this stuff. They're not log management experts. They're not you know, telemetry experts. 
Um, and we want them to be able to come in and kind of casual, you know, come in casually to this tool and get something done. Um, but we had all that context to draw on with these different you know, history of languages that people are used to. So we came up with about a dozen uh, use cases that we thought kind of covered the spectrum of, of you know, what would people bring, pre bring people into a scenario like this. And we actually gamed those out. How would you solve this particular question if we were using an SQL-like approach or, or an approach based on this tool or approach based on that tool? And so we, we did this like big exploration and we were able to boil down uh, boil everything down to about 10 fairly simple commands that, uh, that, that pretty much covered the gamut. By comparison, um, you know, there are other, other solutions that have over 100 commands, um, and it, obviously there's just a lot to learn there. At the other end of the spectrum, um, SQL really does all of this with one command, select, um, and it's incredibly powerful, but you also really have to be a wizard sometimes to kind of shoehorn that into yeah. Yeah, even though SQL's out there, people know that, but people want it easier, and ultimately machines are going to be taking over. You get the 10 commands, you almost can get to the efficiency level of simplifying the use cases. What's the customer scenario look like? What's that, why is design important? What's, what's in it for the customer? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the user experience was a really important focus for us when designing power queries. Uh, we knew from the start that uh, if a tool took you 10 minutes to relearn every time you wanted to use it, then the query takes 10 minutes to execute. It doesn't take seconds to execute. So one of the ways we approach this problem was to make sure we're constantly giving the user feedback. Uh, that starts as soon as you load the page. You've, you've immediately got access to some of the documentation you need to use the feature. If uh, you type uh, incorrect syntax, you'll get feedback from the system about how to fix that problem. And so really focusing on the user experience was uh, a big part of the... Yeah, people don't factor in the time it takes to actually do the query, write it up. If you have to code it up and figure it out, that's time lag right there. You want to be as fast as possible. Interesting design point, it's right. logical, right? Absolutely. So Steve, how, how does it go fast? Jeff, how does it go fast? What are you guys looking at here? What's the magic? So let me, I'm going to step over to the, uh, to the whiteboard. chalkboard here. Chalkboard. Um, and we'll, so chalk in one hand, Mike in the other, will will evaluate my juggling skills. But I um, wanted to start by showing an example of what one of these queries looks like. You know, I talked about how we kind of boil everything down to about 10 commands. So, so let's talk through a simple scenario. Let's say I'm running uh, a tax site. Uh, you know, people come to our website and they're, you know, they're putting their taxes together and they're downloading forms. And um, tax laws are different in every state. So I have different code that's running for, you know, you know people in California versus people in Michigan or whatever. And um, I can, you know, it's easy to do things like graph the overall performance and error rate for my site, but I might have a problem with the code for one specific state uh, and it might not show up in those overall statistics very clearly. So I want to I get a sense of how well, I'm, how well I'm performing for each of the 50 states. So, uh, so I'm gonna, and I'm going to simplify this a little bit, but you know, I might have an access log for this system where we'll see entries like, uh, you know, we're loading the tax form and it's for the state of California and the status code was 200, which means that was successful. Um, and then we load the tax form, and the state is Texas, uh, and again, that was a success. Uh, and then we load the tax form for Michigan, and the status was a 502, which is a, a server error. Uh, and then, you know, and mil millions of these mixed in with other kinds of logs from other parts of my system. And so I want to pull up a report. What percentage of requests are succeeding or failing by state? And um, uh, so let me sketch for first what the, the query would look like for that. Uh, and then I'll talk about how, how we execute this uh, at speed. So, um, so first of all, I have to say what, which, you know, of all my other, you know, I've, I've drawn just the relevant logs, but this is going to be mixed in with all the other logs from my system. Um, and I need to say which, which logs I care about. Well, uh, maybe as simple as just calling out uh, that they all have the, this page name in them tax form. So that, that's the first step of my query. I'm searching for tax form. Um, and now I want to count these, uh, count how many of these there are, how many of them succeeded or failed, and I want to cluster that by state. So I'm going to, uh, clustering is with the group command. So I'm going to say I want to count the total number of requests 
which is just the count. So count is a, a part of the language. Total is what I'm choosing to name that. And I want to count the errors, which is also going to be the count command. But now I'm going to give it a condition. Um, I want to only count where the status is at least 500. And I don't know whether you can see that, but uh, behind the plant is a 500. Um, and I'm going to group that by state. So we're, we're counting up how many of these values were above 500, uh, and we're grouping it by this field. And what's going to come out of that is a table uh, that'll say for each state, the total number of requests, the number of errors. Um, oh, and sorry, I, I actually I left out a couple of steps, but so let's, let's, but actually let's draw what this would give us so far. So that's going to show me for California, uh, maybe I had 9,152 requests, 13 of them were errors, for Texas I had, and so on. Uh, but I'm still not really there, you know, that might show me that California had, you know, maybe California had 13 errors and Rhode Island had 12 errors. But only, there were only 12 requests for Rhode Island. Rhode Island is broke, you know, I've broken my code for Rhode Island. But it's only 12 errors because it's a smaller population. So that's, you know, this analysis is still not quite going to get me where I need to go. Um, so I can now add another command. Um, I've done this group, now I'm going to say, I'm going to say let, which triggers a calculation, let error rate equal uh, errors divided by total. And so that's going to give me the fraction. And so for California, you know, that might be 0 0.01 or whatever. Uh, but for Rhode Island, it's going to be 1. 100% 1 of the requests are failing. Uh, and then I can add another command to sort by the error rate. And now my problem states are going to pop to the top. So real easy to use language. It's you know, great for data scientists digging in there, practitioners. You don't need to be hardcore coder to get into this. Exactly. That's the idea. You know, group, sort, you know, very simple commands that just directly, you know, kind of match the English description of, of what you're trying to do. Um, so then, but, you know, you asked a great question then, which is how do we take this whole thing and execute it quickly? So, um, actually, I'm going to erase here. And so kind of start you're getting over. at the speed now, right? So this yeah. would be like the, how you get the speed, actually. Exactly. Speed is good. So Simplicity to use, I get that. So now speed becomes the next challenge. Exactly. Um, and the speed feeds into the simplicity also because, you know, step one for any, any tool like this is learning the tool. Yeah. And that involves a lot of trial and error. And if the trial and error involves waiting and then at the end of the wait for a query to run, you learn that, oh, you did the query wrong, that's very discouraging to people. Um, so we actually think of speed really then becomes some uh, ease of use. Got it. But um, all right, so how do we actually do this? So you've got, you know, you'll have your whole mass of log data, uh, the tax forms, the other forms, internal services, database logs, whatever. You've got your whole, you know, maybe terabytes of log data. Somewhere in there are the, the, the really important stuff, the tax form errors, as well as all the other tax form logs mixed in with a bigger pile of everything else. Yeah. So step one is to filter from that huge pile of all your logs down to just the tax form logs. Um, and for that, we were able to leverage our existing query engine. Um, and one of the main things that makes that engine, there's kind of two things that make that, that engine uh, as fast it is, as it is. Um, it's massively parallel. So we, we segment the data across hundreds of servers, uh, our servers. Um, so all this data is already distributed across all these servers. Um, and and that's your databases. So you guys exactly. built your own in-house. Okay, got it. Exactly. So this is on our system. So we've, we've already collected, we're collecting the logs in real time. So by the time the user comes and types in that query, we already have the data and it's already spread out across uh, all these servers. Um, so then the, you know, the first step of that query was just a search for tax form. Um, and so that's our existing query engine. That's not the new thing we built for power queries. Um, so that existing very highly optimized engine, this server scans through these logs, this server scans through these logs, each server does its share. And they uh, collectively produce um, a smaller set of data, which is just the tax form logs. Uh, and that's still distributed, by the way. So really, each server is doing this independently and, and is going to continue locally doing the next step. 
So, so we're harnessing the horsepower of all these servers. Each, they each only have to work with a small fraction of the data. Um, then the next step was that group command. We were counting the requests, counting the errors, and rolling that up by state. So that's the new engine we've built. Uh, but again, it, each server can do just its little share. So this server um, is going to take whichever tax form logs it found and produce a little table of uh, counts in it by state. The server is going to do the same thing. So they each produce their little grouping table with just their share of the logs. Got it. Um, and then all of that funnels down to one central server where we do the later steps. We do the division, divide number of errors by total count, and, and then sort it. But by now, you know, here we might have, you might have trillions of log messages down to millions or billions of messages that are relevant to your query. Now we have, here we have 50 records, you know, just one for each state. So suddenly the amount of data is very small. And so the, you know, the later steps may be kind of interesting from a processing perspective, but they're easy from a speed perspective. So you solve a lot of database challenges by understanding kind of how things flow once you've got everything with the Polymer databases there. Um, just give a perspective of like what the alternative would be if we, this is like if I just threw this into a database and I'm running SQL, trillions of log files. I mean, it's not trivial. I mean, it, it's a database problem, then it's a user problem kind of combined. What's order of magnitude difference if I was going to do the old way? Yeah, so, I mean, the, I mean, the truth is there's a hundred old ways now, right? It's a complicated world. How much pain yeah. is there out there? You know, if you're going to, um, you know, if you, if you try to just throw this all into one, you know, SQL server, you know, MySQL or Postgres or whatever on one server, it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, you know, you've got terabytes of data. And, and by the way, we're glossing over, the data has to exist, yeah. but it also has to get into the system. So, you know, in, you know, when you're checking, you know, am I letting everyone in Rhode Island down on the night before, you know, the 15th, um, you need up to the moment yeah. information. Uh, but the date, you know, your database is not necessarily, even if it could hold the data, it's not necessarily designed to be pulling that in in real time. So, you know, just sort of a simple approach, like let me f spin up MySQL and throw all the data in. It's, it's just not even going to happen. It's not even going to happen. So now you're sharding the data or you're looking at some, you know, other database solution or whatever. And it, it, it's a heavy lift either way. It's a lot yeah. of extra effort taxing on the developers. Yeah. You guys do the heavy lifting. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Where's the scale features come in? Where do you see this evolving for the customers? So, um, you know, so Jeff talked about uh, autocomplete, which um, you know, we're really excited about because it's going to, again, you know, a lot of this is for the casual user. You know, they're, you know, they're a power user of you know, JavaScript or Java or something. You know, they're building the code. And then they've got to come in and solve the problem and get back to what they think of as their real job. And um, so you know, we think autocomplete. Um, and the way we're doing it where we're really leveraging both the, the context of what you're typing as well as the history of what you and your team have done and queried in the past, uh, as well as the content of your data. Um, you know, we think of it a little bit like the the browser location bar, which somehow you type about two letters and yeah. it knows exactly which page you're yeah. looking for, uh, because it's relying on all those different kinds of cues. Um, yeah, it's, it seems like the, this is foundational, heavy lift, you minimize, all, minimize all that pain, then you get the autocomplete, you start to get into much more of AI, machine learning kicks in, more intelligent reasoning, you start to get a feel for the data, it seems like. Yeah. Steve, thanks for sharing that. There it is on the whiteboard. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching this CUBE conversation.